Okay, Angela, we're live. This is Angela Keaton, Director of Operations, antiwar.com, and also an intellectual in your own right. I've heard you give amazing speeches. Um, so I'm thrilled to be here with you. Is this actually live? Yes, of course. Oh, so people are actually watching. Yes, that's Oh, indeed. great. <laughs> All right, so I'll be on my, on my absolute best, uh, best appropriate behavior. Uh, we would be so disappointed if that were true. Well, thanks to enormous peer pressure and, and, and bullying from uh, members of our community, I'm, I'm here with you today, and I'm very glad oh. that antiwar.com joined uh, liberty.me yesterday. Yeah, After see. amazing brutalism toward us, you must, 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 must join. <laughs> <laughs> so, that's right. I'm impressed, uh, by the way. You literally got, like, every everybody to sign up, all my friends, even neighbors. I was, just, I was stunned at, how, <laughs> at, at who, who'd been convinced. <laughs> Well, look, I'm not. I'm not convincing anybody. It's, I think it's it's the platforms that's convincing because it's it's just a really cool uh, space for sort of incubating ideas, and it's a nice community. So that I mean, that's it's selling itself. It's not. I don't have to work at it. Uh, it's really great. I mean, it's keeping, keeping our cult group contained to one area so we stop spreading and haranguing everyone on Twitter and Facebook, so we don't scare off the old right and the hard left. <laughs> People can find all the behaviors right there, all the dysfunctionality. It's like yeah. one large dysfunctional extended <laughs> family. A lot of deviant yeah. behavior. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, insofar as that's possible in the digital space, that's exactly what's going on. Uh, no, I mean, what, what's, what's fun about it is that since everybody's got kind of skin in the game, everybody more or less um, wants to see the value of the property enhanced, and so people just assume they're friends, which is a little different from what you get elsewhere. Right. If you know what I mean, yeah. Um, but look, just we don't need to say this to the end. If you want to join Liberty.me, you can go there now, subscribe, and put in your code, which is anti-war, mm -hmm. right, on the checkout yes. page, and then you get a third off. I mean, like a savings of about thirty-five percent off the usual rate, which brings it down just to, to absurd levels. It's like the price of a bag of chips once a month or something like that, and you get the whole experience, including nightly classes and um, and plenty of anti-war discussion, but of discussion on every aspect of, of human liberty. So, not only that, if you join using the code anti-war, then that also supports antiwar.com because that. You know that you get a, you have an affiliate relationship with us, so everybody wins for this. So if you'd like antiwar.com, you can join Liberty Me and also support antiwar.com. So everybody wins with this little situation here. Absolutely, uh, Angela. Can you just back up real quick? I mean, antiwar.com is a very famous uh, website. Everybody knows about it, but maybe not. I mean, it was founded pretty early on in the digital age. Yes, actually, it was actually. A, a, Really innovators. Um, Eric Gare is our founder, and along with Justin Raimondo, Alexia Gilmore, and Colin Hunter, who were all, and this is kind of an important thing, all part of Rothbard's Radical Caucus II, which was a very important part of the history of the Libertarian Party. It basically, the second attempt, uh, the first Radical Caucus being Sam Conkin's group, um, to return the Libertarian Party to its, to its radical roots, as well as libertarianism to, to its core base. And in 1995, um, in December of 1995, Eric Garris bought the URL antiwar.com. 95, that was the first year that, enter, that you could even go out and buy domains like that, wasn't it? Yes, in December, December of 1995. And if you recall, I mean, there's a, I mean, Bill Clinton, that, uh, that, uh, that, that particular monster, um, was, of course, carpet bombing Iraq every three days and doing all kinds of middle, middle European adventures at the time. No one, everyone forgets just You're how... Right. The Iraq War has been going on since 1991, right? It's not. It's not. There's been no actual gap in it. It's, we've been we've been destroying the Iraqi people for a very long time. And as my uh, my real life buddy Anthony Gregory says, I mean that basically is the crime of the 20th 21st century is what we've done to the Iraqi people. And I kind of want to take that back to what's important about antiwar.com. If you kind of distill um, the teachings of Murray Rothbard. The, the most horrible, horrible thing the state does, of all the things the state does, is commit mass murder. It's a, it's a violence against, I mean, it, it's, it's horrific mass violence that makes absolutely no sense to the rational mind, and the rational mind and logic being important for those of us from the objectivist tr tradition. Um, Antiwar.com, i got to say, we have an impeccable libertarian uh, legacy going back to when a young, like, 14, 15-year-old Justin Armando was called a genius by Ayn Rand. 
And that, of course, begins a whole history of things that leads up to antiwar.com. It's amusing. I know we laugh, but I mean, it is, it's all very, very important. I, I do think antiwar.com is the core of what is important about what we do, is, as Ron Paul would say, we are the ones who are against violence. There's all kinds of important things the libertarian movement does. I mean, you know, whether it's fighting against, you know, your lack of choice in light bulbs or being able to, to smoke marijuana recreationally or many other things. Like the Libertarian Party, for example, is on the vanguard of gay marriage and sexual privacy back in the 70s. The libertarians were the ones who started that. I mean, it, it goes very, very hand in hand with the liberation, you know, sexual liberation and, the gay, and gay liberation. These are all important things. But... The most dangerous thing that the, that, that the state does is kill people, and we're saying kill people. I mean, people on the maps, whether it's in, you know, when we talk about when people are casual about talking about let's bomb Iran, for example, the squiggles on the maps are where people live. Human beings live there, and they are people just like you and me. They have families. They have mothers. They have interactions with people. They have hobbies. They have goals and aspirations and dreams. They love their children, and I know this is sometimes hard for people to get, but Central Asians and Persians and Muslims, um, and all, pe all people love their children and they love their grandparents just like we do. They're human beings that have, they're fully realized. So when we do what we do so casually, it's really the, it's the ultimate form, of course, of uh, state worship as well as a, a term that gets thrown around a lot that I think is hard, terribly misunderstood by most libertarians, but the idea of privilege. Because it is a privilege when you live under the emperor. Of course, until the point that the war, the war, wars, endless war, the empire, it's constantly eroding our civil liberties. Now, I was born post civil liberties. Like I don't I don't I mean I didn't really live under a fourth amendment. Nixon had already brought in the war on drugs by the time I was a child. So the most of us and probably most of the people living here and everyone who's watching this is post new deal. So our relationship with the state is that of really uh, an authoritarian a, a tyrant and, and child. I mean all of us that's how all of us relate to the world. None of us really know any differently. But most of that behavior can be tied to things like empire. Empire has destroyed civil liberties through the Patriot Act, through all everything, all the way up to, and a lot of us don't really try to psychologically live in denial about this, and particularly we do at antiwar.com because of our particular circumstance, but the surveillance state, all the way to the NSA, where every conversation, every electronic communication we have is monitored, which of course erodes the dignity of normal relationships. I mean, so much of the intimacy of regular relationships are like when I am discussing family matters with my sister. These are the things that, you know, are the most basic human being, yet someone's recording them. Now, I don't know who's listening or whatnot for other reasons, but that very thing is what destroys dignity. Ayn Rand have a lot to say about what privacy means, the part of civilized man as we develop privacy, that autonomy, that space, and that, of course, is all destroyed, and that is all part of the empire. And the empire comes home in many ways. I mean, if you have the misfortune of being poor or being a person of color, you live under the drug war, so in which constantly reinforces the empire. The drug war is the war at home, and that reinforces what we do with the empire. And then veterans come back from Af Afghanistan and Iraq, and they join the police forces, and they recreate the behavior and the techniques and what they did to, they, what they do to civilians here is what they were doing to the, the non-people, the people that were dismissed as being human but overseas, the one, the people that we consider disposable, because clearly they're not uh, light-skinned or smart enough or they don't have the proper gods they worship they do something differently or their customs are different or the tastes are different as if they have no particular autonomy or feelings of their own so to me that this is I mean to me personally but also to the entire you know all of the antiwar.com staff past present and future and we are a bit of a cult group because we are pretty tightly we all very much agree on these core values about what it means to you know what it means to end the state and that means we have to end empire. I mean we're not ending empire. We're talking about war, occupation and torture. These are the most horrible things and people live under these conditions every day. I mean somewhere there's a child who's grown up and he what he knows is that he saw his grandparents being blown up and we send killer robots overseas. I mean what kind of no civilized country would do that. That's the least civilized behavior I could possibly imagine. That's barbaric. History is going to have there's going to be no reconciliation for what the U.S. did in this period of history, there's going to be—it'll be like—it'll be like, it'd be like Nazi, Germany, Nazi Germany, or communist Russia. There's going to be no way you can justify or explain this behavior. We're supposed to be the most civilized, advanced society on Earth, the one with the most wealth, the most technical advancement, the most liberal in terms of diversity, and yet this is what we do to other people. 
It's disgraceful, and it's something that any person who has any decency at all should be outraged on a day-to-day -day basis, and it, it affects everything we do, and I try to make these points over and over and over again, regardless of which kind of stripe of libertarian or when I'm speaking to people on the old right or the hard left, and we do have allies in their places, and we do have people at different parts of the spectrum who don't understand the libertarian project, but we... You know, the United States is, is, is nominally a Protestant Christian country where we talk a lot of things about Christianity and family values. But what we do with the empire is absolutely antithetical to that. War and militarism, the whole lifestyle of military, the, the military lifestyle, divorce, adultery, illegitimacy, domestic violence, alcoholism, suicide, none of these things fit in with those values. They're all antithetical to that. So when, we, when I hear Christians, you know, being pro-military, I don't believe they're Christians. I mean, they have to be denounced and exposed as frauds because that's such a horrible, horrible thing. And as for as far as what I call the corporate left, you know, in other words, the phony progressives and the Democratic Party, which is entirely bought and sold by corporations, it's not in any way liberal or progressive. But when they support the the Emperor Obama's wars, what they're supporting is an entire symbolism. And you know, the mili military symbolism is the symbol of patriarchy. It's based on racial hierarchy. It's, of course, when you talk about masculinity in the empire, that's when we get into things like homophobia and transphobia. Those things exist in the real, and they are allowed to exist permanently because of the empire. What does it mean to be a man? It means to suit up and go kill a foreigner. It means to go kill a poor person. And the other things it does that disrupt us as a society is that milit the military actively recruits from poor people, from men of color, and tells them that this is their only way out, in order way to be fully... American to be fully um, adult in our society is to be part of this warrior class, and of course, we, we, of course, we, then we're also very uh, we're very hypocritical and weird too about how we treat veterans and, and active military. But one step at a time. That that mentality basically is that your job, you know, you're 17 years old and you're going to sign your life away, possibly getting your arm chopped off or being completely emotionally destroyed and scarred or having your whole family destroyed or waking up with horrible flashbacks as you want to kill yourself that that's what we do, that's how that system works. I mean, that's utterly barbaric, and it creates an entire permanent class structure, which is horrible, because the 1%, and I, I do like that term that the left used, because it really helps bring in the whole Rothbardian class analysis, you know, the political class analysis, right. is that those people never serve. The people, at the very, the people who, who, set, who set these policies do not have to sacrifice anything. Dick Cheney's never had to sacrifice anything for this ever endless war. Certainly Bill Crystal hasn't. I mean, it's, it's, it's a horrible, horrible thing that we have done, and it's, it's a horrible thing that we do to people. And the be all you can be, being all you can be means, you know, coming back with a missing limb. Um, I can't possibly think of that as being rational. Do you get communications from, from readers sometimes, uh, like, oh, this is a wonderful anti-war uh, site, but I'm slowly discovering, actually, that your orientation is libertarian, Therefore, you're really just a secret tool of the, 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 the corporate, corporate uh, class of exploiters. Well, you know, um, the, uh, I, I, you know it, one thing, people, you know, people can talk a lot of different things, but the, the Paul Tard coke to push machine is pretty exclusively anti-war when you get to the heart of it. I mean, there's not very many libertarians. I mean, it tends to be very fringy and in small places that support the war effort. People, the sophisticated people of the old right, a lot of, for example, people who read the American Conservative, as well as people, let's say, who read Counterpunch, so it's kind of the, the left that's part of, let's say, Alexander Cooper's right. mentality, they're used to us. And the fact is that, that antiwar.com specifically, but the libertarian movement has been at the vanguard of the antiwar movement. They know what our history is, and well, those who know that we're sincere and we're real, the, and that's what we put first. And this is the beautiful thing about what anti-war has always always done. I mean, I've always been appreciated not just as a source of, of news and 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 wild entry and sometimes you know so, sometimes wild but always interesting commentary. Uh, is that I feel like it's it's made sort of the cause of liberty, uh, I, I guess, look good. I mean, it's it's just very valuable for us as as a as a body of thought to have, to be out there in the front. I mean, antiwar.com is the leading anti-war site in the world, isn't it? Yes. And just to be, just so we're really clear, we do not say that we're a libertarian site. We're staffed by libertarians. Our orientation is libertarian. We never hide the ball. We never pretend we're anything other than what we are. But if you look at the site and we look at what we print, we print everyone. It's Noam Chomsky. It's Pat Buchanan. It's Daniel Ellsberg. Everybody from the American conservative, including people like a former CIA agent like Phil Giraldi, all have space on there to speak. 
it's a very broad-based coalition on a very narrow set of issues, and we keep it that way because that's what we can do to create a mass movement. Now, this is somewhat controversial. There are people who can believe you can, we can influence the elites, and there are people who work on that project in D.C. There are, there are people, you know, moneyed people, very sophisticated people from the old right who try to work very hard at influencing people in D.C., but that effort has been a very long, slow process. But another long, slow process has been is creating a mass movement and creating a, a movement of where everyone is welcome to be a part of the anti-war movement, part of the things where we've gone wrong. And, I, I mean, it's easy to pick on answer. It's easy to pick on people on the left on this. But most of the anti-war protests in the past 12 years aren't focused. They end up being a grab bag of issues. Now, I, I love the gold standard. I'm all about being gay. Those are terrific. But they have nothing to do with the issue of letting us get the hell out of Afghanistan. And when people go to an answer rally and you've got, and say you've got a practicing Catholic Mexican family that comes in and they want to be a part of this, and the first thing they're handed are, here's your free abortion coupon, and they're haunted with these, all these other issues that don't make any sense to them and don't fit into what they're, you know, where they're coming from, mm -hmm. it's very exclusionary. Um, it, it, should not, it should be a very narrow, limited agenda, and that's really what we focus on at antiwar.com. We what don't, it, not a litmus test. What is it you're trying to do? It's, to create a mass movement, to create a mass movement, and this is the anti-war movement, it must be something that is open to middle Americans. It must be open to conventional families, open to Christians. It needs to be something that is welcoming to people who are anti-war, regardless of what their other issues are. Not everyone agrees with us on, on, on how we see finance. Not everyone understands our particular view of how the Fed affects things. But that should have nothing to do with whether we welcome people into the anti-war movement. But antiwar.com is not so much an activist site so much as it is the best sort of sort of source of information and commentary. I always go there. Um, I mean, just as, as such a portal for what you need to know. And the thing that always amazes me is that you're always there. I mean, like I can lose interest in this topic for four months and then get interested in it because I'm writing about something. Go to the page. Everything's fresh. Everything's new. You know, full massive links. I mean, how is it possible to keep up that pace of, of relentless development the way you do? Um, it's a very unusual. And part of it is because of our leadership. Eric Garris is utterly tireless. I've never met anyone with this kind of energy or devotion. All the staff, uh, former members of the staff, current members of the staff, everyone is committed in some way, in some form, and no one's really stopped working. But it's a lifestyle. I mean, you work at antiwar.com. You've kind of committed to a way of life. <laughs> and the age is freshened every day. There's new stories. You know, you don't go to, I mean, there's no really, there's no stopping. I mean, it's not like you get a day off. It sounds like, like a perfect description of what I've, what's going on at Liberty.me, actually. That's why I'm laughing. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Exactly you, the you, same thing. You've made a lifestyle choice. This is yeah. not a regular job. You're I mean, all you're right. in. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Uh, do you find that traffic goes up and down depending on whether foreign? Because uh, you know, Americans, they want people want to forget about foreign policy because it actually doesn't affect them directly, at least uh, as far as I know. So it's only when wars kind of become hot, when they come in the news, when there's a big Syria conflict, or you know something's happening that the average member of the bourgeoisie is even interested in this question. Do you do you find that your traffic uh, goes up and down based on 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 how hot or or boring the international situation is? Yes, I mean, certain, and certain topics are real hot buttons. I mean, obviously, a year ago, when, excuse me, that uh, when Glenn Greenwald and Edward Snowden and Laura Portress and all these wonderful people who put their put them, their lives literally on the line to reveal information, um, traffic went through the roof again. New new wars tend to do that. Uh, new wars and new revelations tend to make it go up. People think it doesn't affect them though, but it does affect them. It affects, of course, uh, their dollar. Um, it's part of the reason, you know, we, our critique of the Fed, when the, our finances keep shrinking, the war is making us poorer overall. It destroys resources. There's no wealth creation with war. I mean, there's the myth, and that's regularly debunked by all of our libertarian economists about World War II. Um, no one, I mean, it's a very, very tiny, tiny group of people who benefit at all from the war. Right. But certainly normal people do not, economically. And of course, the people who are getting killed certainly do not benefit. But this is, in a, in a way, I have I admire antiwar.com even more in times when you know there isn't anything going on because because it's relentless. It's always always there, always available. Uh, it never stops, and it's 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 easier to it's easy to do fun, exciting things when everybody's listening and watching and caring about what you're doing. But but uh, it's it's a much more difficult to maintain the kind of schedule that you do. Um, when it's out of the news. 
No, it's it, 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 that's what I mean. I mean, like a lifestyle commitment. Because the fact is, the wars continue regardless, and there's always secret wars going on. Nixon had secret wars. Clinton had secret wars. Obama has secret wars. The drone wars, basically. That some of that's covered really well in uh, the Jeremy Scahill book and the movie Dirty Wars. I mean, these things continue regardless of whether or not we're interested in them, and uh, it happens all the time. Uh, Angela, um, so here's a here's a, a sort of question for you. Um, because, I mean, let's face it, this topic is, in a way, depressing. Mm -hmm. it, it can be, uh, I mean, you feel a tremendous amount of passion for it, and I can, I can sense that from you, but, but, but how, do you, how do you focus on such uh, negativity or such depressing stuff all the time? I mean, every day you're looking at news stories. Every day you're feeling moral outrage. I mean, does it get exhausting? Yeah, but, I mean, drugs and misanthropy help. <laughs> you know, I have I have one of the worst attitudes of anyone in the movement. I have the least amount of team spirit for our family, but I think in most ways I'm the anarchist cheerleader because, you know, I, because I have to go out. I mean, I, you know, Eric Garris, uh, you know, is our leader, and Justin Romando does his thing in the woods. We kind of keep, you know, our our, our H. L. Mencken kind of up in the woods in Northern California, you know, away, kind of isolated and. You know, Scott Horton on and off for you. I mean, well, Scott's, a, you know, one of my personal heroes. Uh, yeah, I agree. I, I just, I feel like I outsource all my foreign policy knowledge to him, you know. That, <laughs> that he's there just makes me feel like, well, I can always ask Scott. You know? But I have to, I'm the one who goes out on the road, and I'm the one who has to speak to Code Pink, and I'm the one who talks to Birchers, and yes, I do. I don't care. I don't care where I go to speak. I will speak to anyone who's interested in ending, who understands that we must end empire and militarism. And when I have to go out there, of course, I have to defend everyone from the Paul family to the Koch brothers because I come with all this baggage because I, people know where I came from. I mean, I, I do this because I am committed to this particular set of, I, this, this particular ideology and this philosophy of, you know, the non-aggression principle. It's non-violence. And that's the source, I think, of all civilized human relationships. We want to be fully adult. If we want to really advance as a, as a species or whatever the hell, we have to agree on non-aggression. And that's, I, that, to me, is what the heart of this is. And this is the most aggressive thing we do. So, yeah, it, it's hard not to have a bad attitude at the 1400 time. I mean, every day you're reading about death. That's what you're at, death, pointless property destruction, the ending of cultures, the undermining of, of countries, and what we and that's why what we did in Iraq was so horrific. We totally destroyed an entire infrastructure. We took a country that was actually semi-modern and had right. that was functioning, as horrible as that monster Saddam was, and that isn't, you know, and, I mean, we're not apologists for any of the regimes that we're trying, you know, of the people. We're, we're defending the people, not the regimes, but we turned Iraq into a literal hellhole. An absolute nightmare. That's what the United States is. And I say we, and I'm thinking about this. I mean, we we all contribute in the ways, whether it's through the use of our Federal Reserve notes, which is why you know we talk about digital currency, or just our passivity or our supporting the troops. I mean, wherever I go, and I talk about this, I fly Southwest a lot. Oh, we have one of our soldiers on the plane. Well, what am I clapping for? I'm clapping for a very large welfare system that I would never want to pay into in the first place because that's what it is. It's a, it is a welfare system. And what the what the recipients do or go out and kill people to make that supposedly to make me feel safe and all they've done is make my life more dangerous and more difficult. So it's a it's a horrible thing and it, yeah, it doesn't you know, you you have to be completely committed to it to want to stop Well, it. but there's also another side to it also, but uh, in that insofar as you're revealing this information, getting the word out, educating people, becoming a, a portal for the revelations that people would otherwise not ever have access to, aren't you actually increasing the likelihood of peace, just just on the, on the margin, just, just helping the world to be uh, a more honest, true, and maybe just place? I, th I think that's what we're doing, but we've had, and, but I mean, it's not just us. I mean, it's been a collective libertarian effort. I mean, one of the best known anti-war activists now is a uh, an elderly uh, optician named Ron Paul, and one of the things why he's so important is is that he knows how to speak to normal people. He knows how to speak to Middle America in a way that a lot of us probably don't, because you know we come to anarchism, uh, which is where I'm coming from. You know, with other you know other things like whether it's you know support for LGBT liberation and other, these other issues, um, he knows how to speak to normal people about the war, and he's done so much in terms of getting regular people to realize how horrible this is. And one of the things in 2008 when I was in uh, Minneapolis is when 
this huge alternative GOP convention that Ron Paul had, and that end the Fed chant became the end the war chant. And there was probably only one other time in my life that I could hear 11,000 people scream end the war, and that was right. the very first um, protest in, in Austin, Texas, for uh, against the Iraq war. I mean, against uh, yeah, or the invasion of invasion of Iraq. Which right. one? Um, the most recent. This would have been the. Um, this would have been in 2000. Two, three. Yeah, two, yeah, yeah. <laughs> 2000, I'm sorry, it's all swimming in my head right now. But yeah, because I'm there was 90, Yeah, there was a ton of them. Actually, <laughs> <laughs> we, keep, we keep invading and reinvading and reinvading. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay, so you mentioned digital currency. One of the things that we're doing at Liberty.me is accepting Bitcoin and. Uh, that also works with the discount code anti-war on the second page. So if you use that and, and want to subscribe with Bitcoin, then uh, anti-war also benefits from that. And I understand now that anti-war is also accepting uh, Bitcoin. Well, we've actually been accepting it. Uh, we, we started accepting it formally in November of 2012, but we've decided to make it a more formal part of the educational process, that digital currency generally is peace currency. And it's really not, we're not trying to get people to disrupt their lives economically, but we want people to think more deeply about mm. our financial system and how it, how the constant printing of money is going to allow empire forever. I didn't realize that you were accepting Bitcoin even before I, I believed it was anything other than magic internet money. So that's, that's very well, I used to call it a profane name, which I won't say on your, on, 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 in, onto the Liberty Me viewers. It's only, <laughs> I had my own I name. I can imagine. Me. Yeah, uh, being kind of you know old school Austrian, I kind of you know had my butt. It took a while. It took a while for me too. It took about two years actually. Yeah. It doesn't matter whether I like it or not. Digital currency is here. We're yeah. going to use that, and um, people talk about the dollar collapsing. But as long as the system is able to print money and get people to psychologically accept that, empire can go on and on. And when I say empire, we have somewhere between seven hundred and a thousand bases around the world where the yeah. U.S. has a presence and is maintaining them. Yeah, what a beautiful, peaceful, commercial republic we are. Um, so uh, now, Antiwar is going to be posting at least one article on Liberty.me a week, as I understand it. So I'm excited. Probably every day. You're going to be posting every day. I think every day. I think we kind of talked about that last night with our with our staffers and said, well, yeah, we're going to probably put good. something on there every well, day. The, the traffic is there. You know, I think I think yesterday we had 25 new articles on the site. It's growing all the time. <clears throat> Network is booming. Um, every day, we, you know, there's just a flurry of new subscribers. So I'm just really happy to welcome you, and uh, you know, you play a very important role here. Uh, I admire your work. I uh, it's a pleasure to talk to you. Actually, I, I'm intrigued by your perspective. Always have been. Um, I've seen you at several conferences. I appreciate your passion, your consistency, your kind of old world, you know, hard hardcore anarch objectivist anarchism. Many things are wonderful about you, Angela, and your work ethic too. And I appreciate your uh, willingness to cooperate uh, together with Liberty Me. So. Well, thank you. Uh, so, uh, in closing, just go uh, if if you're if you're interested in subscribing to Liberty Me, which you should be. Uh, just uh, you can subscribe and put in that code antiwar.com. Help both ventures, and we all grow together. Thanks all so right. much, Angela. Oh, well, thank you. Okay, bye-bye. Yeah. Your code, which is anti-war, mm -hmm. right, on the checkout yes. page, and then you get a third off, I mean, like a savings of about 35% off the usual rate, which brings it down just to, to absurd levels. It's like the price of a bag of chips once a month or something like that, and you get the whole experience, including nightly classes and... Um, and plenty of anti-war discussion, but of discussion on every aspect of, of human liberty. So not only that, if you join using the code anti-war, then that also supports antiwar.com because that you know that you get a, you have an affiliate relationship with us, so everybody wins for this. So if you like antiwar.com, you can join Liberty Me and also support antiwar.com. So everybody wins with this little situation here. Absolutely. Uh, uh, Angela, can you just back up real quick? I mean, antiwar.com is a very famous uh, website. Everybody knows about it, but maybe not. I mean, it was founded pretty early on in the digital age. Yes, actually, it was actually a, a really innovators. Um, Eric Gare is our founder, and as my uh, my real life buddy Anthony Gregory says, I mean, that basically is the crime of the 20th, 21st century of what we've done to the Iraqi people. And I kind of want to take that back to what's important about antiwar.com. If you kind of distill um, the teachings of Murray Rothbard, 
the, the most horrible, horrible thing the state does, of all the things the state does, is commit mass murder. It's a, it's a violence against, I mean, it, it's, it's horrific mass violence that makes absolutely no sense to the rational mind, and the rational mind and logic being important for those of us from the objectivist tradition. Um, Antiwar.com, i got to say, we have an impeccable libertarian uh, legacy going back to when a young, like, 14, 15-year-old Justin Armando was called a genius by Ayn Rand. And that, of course, begins a whole history of things that leads up to antiwar.com. It's amusing. I know we laugh, but, I mean, it's It's all very, very important. I, I do think antiwar.com is the core of what is important about what we do, is, as Ron Paul would say, we're the ones who are against violence. There's all kinds of important things the libertarian movement does. I mean, you know, whether it's... I think it's, it's the platforms that's convincing because it's, it's just a really cool uh, space for sort of incubating ideas, and it's a nice community. So, that I mean, that's it's selling itself. It's not. I don't have to work at it. Uh, it's really great. I mean... It's keeping, keeping our cult group contained to one area so we stop spreading and haranguing everyone on Twitter and Facebook so we don't scare off the old right and the hard left. <laughs> you can all confine all the behaviors right there, all the dysfunctionality. It's like yeah. one large dysfunctional extended <laughs> family. A lot of deviant yeah. behavior. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, insofar as that's possible in the digital space, that's exactly what's going on. Uh, no, I mean, what, what's what's fun about it is that since everybody's got kind of skin in the game, everybody more or less um, wants to see the value of the property enhanced, and so people just assume they're friends, which is a little different from what you get elsewhere. If you know what I mean, yeah. Um, but look, just we don't need to say this to the end. If you want to join Liberty.me, you can go there now, subscribe, and put in. Okay, Angela, we're live. This is Angela Keaton, Director of Operations, AntiWar.com, and also an intellectual in your own right. I've heard you give amazing speeches. Um, so I'm thrilled to be here with you. Is this actually live? Yes, of course. Oh, so people are actually watching. Yes, that's Oh, indeed. great. <laughs> All right, so I'll be on my on my absolute best uh, best appropriate behavior. Oh, uh, we would be so disappointed if that were true. Well, thanks to enormous peer pressure and 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 bullying from uh, members of our community, I'm I'm here with you today, and I'm very glad oh. that antiwar.com joined uh, Liberty.me yesterday. Yeah. After so amazing you... brutalism toward us, you must 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 join. <laughs> <laughs> so that's right. I'm impressed, uh, by the way. You literally got like every everybody to sign up. All my friends, even neighbors. I was just, I was stunned at how <laughs> at, at who who'd been convinced. <laughs> well, look, I'm not I'm not convincing anybody. And along with Justin Ramondo, Alexia Gilmore, and Colin Hunter, who were all and this is kind of an important thing, all part of Rothbard's Radical Caucus too which was a very important part of the history of the Libertarian Party. It basically, the second attempt, uh, the first radical caucus being Sam Conkin's group, um, to return the Libertarian Party to its, to its radical roots as well as libertarianism to, to its core base. And in 1995, um, in December of 1995, Eric Garris bought the URL antiwar.com. 95, that was the first year that, to enter, that you could even go out and buy domains like that, wasn't it? Yes, in December, December of 1995, and if you recall, I mean, there's a, I mean, Bill Clinton, that, uh, that, uh, that, that particular monster, um, was of course carpet bombing Iraq every three days and doing all kinds of middle, middle European adventures at the time. No one, everyone forgets just right. how the Iraq War has been going on since 1991, right? It's not, it's not. There's been no actual gap in it. It's we've been, we've been destroying the Iraqi people for a very long time, 